do we have a, set, a clear sense? I'm not sure we've given them a clear sense of the deadline or due date. No, the due date was, what did we say, this Thursday? Was that what we said? Hmm? You mean Tomorrow? today? Oh, no. Today's what? Thursday. Thursday. Oh, <laughs> I, I'm very I'm still on the So, I have no idea what where, where are you with your assignments? Why don't we just get a sense of, of where you are? Because some of you were asking. What did you just say? Does everyone remember? Tomorrow. 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 Yeah, it's the end of the week. But the problem is tomorrow is a, uh, a day off. Okay. Yeah. So, um, do you That's need more than tomorrow? Is, what, is, I guess, what I'm asking. So, did you want to work on them this weekend, or should we give them until Tuesday? I, I'm all right with that. I'm, I'm, we're, I think uh, if, uh, we are uh, at a point where uh, certain realities have uh, shown up, and uh, we're uh, going to have to have a little extra time. <laughs> I love it when professors beg for extra time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not how much? A professor anymore. <laughs> well, uh, how much extra time? What? Uh, what? Oh, next week. Next week? Next week is good for me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so that will free you up to. Because a number of you were asking me at the end of last class, and I, I didn't have a minute until right now to raise the question with Damien. So, is that yeah. okay? No, that's my fault. I've been conscious for three days. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're going to talk about bodies and consciousness and painkillers. <laughs> we all need those when we're when we're side with us. That's true. Well, what what day should we set? Um, I'm, I'm kind of opening it up to them. If here's the thing, if if work comes in. I'm, I'm book solid typically from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I never get, I never have a chance to get to anything. Next week I'm in New York City on Thursday, and th no Wednesday and Thursday. So why don't we, will, will we be back here for Thursday or I'm? I'm not going to be here on next Thursday because I'm at a conference okay. from okay. New York City. Wednesday. And when do we join Australia? On the oh, so we, hopefully the week after that. Okay, so we'll still be needing well, unless, to unless you need a bit more time for the novel. I can. Well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the novel can take as much time as we want to give it, yeah. uh, or as little time as we want to give it. It's it's really flexible in that way. But the the plan is to do the novel for two three two three weeks, okay. and then there'll be some assignments around the novel, and then we'll move on to something else. Okay. Mm -hmm. So why don't we say Thursday of uh, of next week? If you could, if you could finish up the projects a week from today, and then uh, because there are only a small number of groups, all you need to do is tell me, Patrick, and myself where your file is. Yeah, you can put it online. You can email it to us, whichever mechanism you want, as long as we know. Some of you have done wikis. Some, some okay. have put the files on Canvas. We're happy either, but whichever you want to do, or just email us. Yeah, okay. yeah. We're leaving it for Okay. So there's not a single drop box for this because you're all doing different things. Okay. That's fine with me. Yeah, just like, just so I know where to go to get it. Because there's only a small number of groups. <laughs> okay. Are there other sort of business things that we need to take care of? Well, any questions on that or any comments on what you're doing? Any lingering questions about last time's discussion of Galatea 2.2? We were, I was, I was just sort of showing you a few things about the last few pages of the novel and the first few pages. And I was. Uh, you were giving that spoilers for those of us. I was trying to avoid the spoilers. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I did a very good job of avoiding all of them. But, Do you know, uh, I read an article today that um, if you get spoilers for a movie or a book, you actually enjoy the movie. Really, they've done experiments on people, and people who have pre already know the ending enjoy. But, and apparently, it's because they don't have to concentrate so much on the plot elements because you know what's coming. You can enjoy the other aesthetic aspects of the work. I thought that was the case, but hmm? I thought that was the case, but people looked at pissed at me. You <laughs> mean <laughs> for, for telling this story? Well, no, I don't usually share it, but like, I, it doesn't bother me to go ahead and read what's going on, like read ahead. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, I can read the, the synopsis on Wikipedia or whatever, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I still get to see the movie, and I think I enjoyed it, you know, just as much. But mm -hmm. other people just do not. Like, uh -huh. uh, 
movies and books aren't that big of a deal when you get TV shows. If you spoil a TV show, I can kill you. That was an interesting piece of research. Oh, it's only, got yeah. only got published this week that they did a big experiment with the expectation, pre expectation. I'd love to see the, if you have a, a link for it, I'd love to see it. What movies did they use? Because that seems like it would be, like if, if you spoil the sixth sense or something that's like super that's story with a big twist, yeah, that seems like it would be a big difference. That's the example they give the because they actually have three, they have a control group who didn't get spoilers. Someone with people who got to know the plot. And they also had a group who were told what's coming halfway through. <laughs> which, is, which is which is like someone pops up on the screen and says he's dead. You <laughs> 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 carry on watching the movie. I don't know. But those are the three. And they give that example in the article I read. They said that someone come up and explain in the sixth sense. But they said actually it doesn't work so well with the one in the middle. But people who knew from the start enjoy it more. I can agree with that about like various pop culture references. Like if I've seen the references over like, you know, the 22 years I've been alive, like when I saw The Shining, I was like, oh, oh, that's funny. That's awesome. But that's something, that's a very postmodern thing that we see as, as older people. We see young people who know the pop culture references and memes rather than the original source. We see that more, and I see that more and more that people, for example, like the shiny thing, they all know that he is Johnny, but they don't know where he's from. Mm -hmm. They've never seen the movie. Uh -huh. I see that a lot. Okay. Yeah, just uh, this is, I can work with this conversation. So, I, <coughs> you know, what we're actually talking about is an interesting principle in narrative theory, and uh, it, it, in some ways, it shapes the structure of uh, this kind of a dynamic that we're talking about, it, it, it informs or shapes the structure of Galatea to a point too. So why don't we just, if you want to continue this conversation, we can. I'll work with it. Um, Tom, you want to <coughs> Brian, and then, I'm sorry, I'm going to like on your name. Joe. Joe. So why don't you go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was just going to say, as far as the spoiler thing goes, this whole idea of keeping on the reference, but not knowing what's actually from. Uh, last week, my brother was watching some cartoon show, and they referenced the theme song to Cheers. And he was like, I know that. I don't know what's wrong. I'm just like, how do you not know Cheers? I don't know what Cheers is. Well, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was like everybody's <laughs> like, I remember. I'm sure. But you, you've got to remember it's a cultural aspect yeah. as well. I grew up in a different culture. Well, it was just sort of the fact that it's like, you know, you grew up maybe, like, he grew up five years after me. We were still watching Nick and Nights. We were still watching Cheers and Frasier and stuff. And he, he just had blanked out of the entire He got the reference, but he didn't get why he got it. I was just, I was so disappointed. Joe, did you want to? Oh, I mean, I was just wondering because there are some movies that <coughs> one of like the selling points was that you don't really know what to expect. Uh, immediately, I thought of the movie District Nine because uh, from the trailers and stuff, you don't, they don't really tell you much about the movie at all, but then there's a place called District 9 where there's aliens. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of expectation is part of the enjoyment, the unexpected and the expectation. I, I kind of, I do agree with that, that's an aspect of enjoying something, but not a lot of people do research or something. Mm -hmm. Hold on, we're going to come to time and then we'll circle back around here. Yeah, um, in response to that, that reminded me, uh, real quick, of The Matrix, how when the trailers for that were being released, they kept they were kept very tight-lipped on what is The Matrix, and it was the kind of thing if you thought, okay, we're not going to really understand what it is until the end of the movie, but then Morpheus, like, 30 minutes in, is like, here is pretty much everything you need to know about The Matrix here, and, you know, cut and dry. Um, so there, that's, that's what I noticed about that. Uh, what I was going to say, though, is I think to, to Bill's point about you know spoiling TV shows, the difference between a book and a movie versus a, like a TV show uh, is that you know movies sort of they they're two hours straight complete arc. TV shows like they're sort of designed so that like every 15, 20 minutes, every commercial break, like right before every commercial break, something huge happens or something dramatic. And like the last 30 second, two minute, 30 seconds to two minutes of a TV show is the kind of thing that is 
heavy hitting and you know it's the thing that keeps you going until next week. So you know that's that's why like people don't like spoilers because you know whereas a movie is I guess you could say like it's climactic point. There's really only like one climactic point. TV shows are designed to have numerous climactic points that you don't you know. Also, a TV series is longer than. Okay. So uh, one of the questions that seems to be surfacing here is, uh, in, in general, in the conversation, is uh, what kind of work does the work of art do on us? Right? It's 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 acting on us in some way, and uh, it, and the way in which it acts upon us in some way is dependent upon our state of mind, what it is that we know, what it is that we anticipate. There are always things that we can anticipate. Uh, but then there are these things that we call surprises, right? The thing that we don't anticipate. Artists, writers, might <coughs> design uh, their works so that they create and manage expectations. But what would be involved in an artist designing a surprise would be the question I'd like you to, to think about. And so we, as we're working through Galatea 2.2, one of the questions that you might want to just sort of keep track of in your own reading notes would be, what is it that you're anticipating and where are you surprised? So one of the, one of the questions I'll open up for our discussion as we, as we start to talk about the novelty, <laughs> you know, where were you surprised? And, and what's the nature of the surprise that you, that you experience? And are you surprised in different kinds of ways? That would be, that would be is that helping? These are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing from you about. Uh, Galatea is a 2.2 is a novel that I've taught once, just in one course for one semester. This is my own, really my own, only my second time through the work uh, in terms of just a teaching experience. And um, the, I, I start working on a passage or a moment <coughs> in this novel, and I, I find myself just kind of lost in that particular moment. So my own feeling for the novel right now is somewhat fractured. If, I don't know if that you had that, if you've ever had that experience when you're working with a work of art, where you kind of have this preliminary understanding of it, and then you start to burrow into different component elements, and uh, you start to lose a sense of the movement of the plot or the nature of the whole or what happens to which characters when, uh, and it starts to turn into a different kind of creature for a while. So I'm, I don't have any really kind of organized final word. To, to, to present to you about Galatea 2.2, but I can kind of show you a few things that, I, that are happening. But what I'm really interested in is, is kind of understanding what you're discovering, what your experience of reading it is, largely in relationship to this question about of where, where, where were your anticipations and expectations met? And you said, okay, that makes sense. It's, and I, I kind of knew that was going to happen, versus where, are you, where do you find yourself being surprised? And what? And, and are you surprised in different ways? Those are so. Uh, with now that I've said that, uh, I think uh, Robert, right? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't catch that. You like the. I like no spoilers. I like. Oh, you I, I really like not the where spoilers. they. I love the twists. We just talked about kick ass. And like they, they changed like the genre of the movie mid movie from like movie teen movie to like real like action movie. And like you don't expect it. The way they like the way they just how they advertise it. They advertise it like it's going to be this type of movie. And then it just doesn't flip on you. And if you expect it, it kind of ruins that surprise. It's still fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Multiple ways to look at anything, I guess. Okay. Why don't we just sort of move this way, uh, Brian, and then we'll come up to. I, mean, I think that's like, just in general, most of the other things I would ask you is just how we're advertised you know, to see this piece. Like, I think a great example that no one else saw was this Brad Pitt movie called The Mexican, which was advertised as the worst romantic comedy I've ever <laughs> seen from the trailer. But actually, watching it, it's a really good, sort of criminal, dark comedy about a scumbag in Mexico. 
has nothing to do with romance at all. <laughs> but just because the two main actors were in a bunch of romantic comedies at the time, that's how they advertised it, and that's why everyone hated it. Okay. Um, I think your connection to material has a lot to do with it too. Um, for instance, like, I mean, with Kevin Tan, like, I didn't really feel a connection with it. So I didn't have a lot of expectations going in. I didn't have a lot of expectations or surprise while reading it. So I think that that plays a very big role. Did you walk away <coughs> having read it saying that was... I was like, you know, some person so was some like, person like that. okay. Uh -huh. you know. But nothing, what, you, did you find yourself thinking about it while you were working on the group project? About Galatea? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you were doing the group project at the same time. Yeah, I mean, well, like, like, it was definitely, I mean, I think you're always going to get something out of the material, even if you don't really have a connection or any or expectations with it. So, like, I was definitely able to use the book in um, certain parts of the argument. Uh, where? Where did it serve? Um, what were those points? Well, because uh, Will had brought up um, a great point talking about uh, when the uh, English and British literature. Um, so I think like in sections like that, being able to kind of know that and be able to like to discuss it, help more for the discussion. Uh, did you? Uh, okay, so when you were working out with Will? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same, so, so where did it? Where did the novel kind of inform your own deliberations? Um, in, in, did it shed any light <coughs> on a uh, larger question that you were asking, or did you? Not, I don't really think so. Do you, okay. Right. Well, would you yeah, want to answer? Yeah. <laughs> it's good me. Um, uh -huh. You might have to talk a little about it. The, the point Kevin was talking about was kind of toward the end, and they realized that when they realized all the content in the future didn't exist for Master's Comp anymore, it was kind of like, when you think about how he's influencing this development, that's kind of where our topic kind of came from, is how that influence went sort of him being a trainer, What is the relationship between the trainer and the net, the yeah. neural net, yeah. as opposed to the relationship between the neural net and the <coughs> exam? But Nothing. The, the kind of exam, or what the? Um, the content he was teaching there. What was? What's the impact of that content? I mean, because it's the impact of that content on on the health. Net. And what's the bigger connotation to that? I mean, if he's only teaching her one aspect of lyric history, and there's all these other avenues he could have gone down. I mean, he's coming from a certain bias or a certain perspective, and that perspective that he's imparting from her is going to be, you know, favoring him over the wider spectrum of what is actually up there. And so that limitation is, you know, imprinted onto Helen. Uh, I think you've you've kind of hit on a really interesting point. And I know many of you haven't read this yet. The we just uploaded, we just uploaded this. It's an interview with Richard Powers. And there's a section in it where they ask him, uh, if he's talking about Galatea. And he says that part of the desire of Galatea was to poke fun at the high sanctimoniousness of literary theory. I have no comment to make on that. Whereabouts are you? Uh, I can show it. Um, it's, all, well, it's on page six of mine, but I don't know if you'll uh, What's the end of the way? Keep going down. How does the, uh, the entry begin? It begins with, in other words, the problem is high to the type of specialization and then the one after that. Keep going. Oh, no, that's it. That's it. You got it. Up, up a bit, up a bit, no, sorry, down a bit, I'm <laughs> not with it. Keep going down, keep going down, yeah, keep going words. down. It's a paragraph, how so? Just uh, down a little bit further, and that's it. So that very third, so he's talking about the desire of Galatea to poke fun at literary theory and the story it tells. And it says the book becomes very aware of deconstruction and post structuralism. And when I was reading this, I, I wrote, how, you know, what does that mean? And then, uh, of course, the guy asked the very question I wanted to ask. <laughs> how, so, how does he do that? And he says, and it's his first sentence here, and he says, the book's ultimate vision of mind and consciousness as a negotiated community, its idea of linguistic performance and self-narration, 
being a precarious interchange between sense and symbolic projection. I, th I think that's exactly what you were just talking about with, the, with that. Um, I mean, something I got from the book myself, I, having studied artificial intelligence in my PhD being in it, I got this sense of the subjective nature of the learning process and the teaching process that the guy, this idea of him reading all the time, which paralleled the reading, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the woman, that's his wife who had amnesia. Oh, as well, and reading there, you know, there was this kind of parallel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, it's Audrey. Audrey, okay, but I, I thought you were going to say more. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if you keep going here, uh, he, he does what a lot of people do when they're thinking. They, they, they use a word like something to kind of create a placeholder for uh, making their, their observation a little bit more precise. So, um, and, and he's, uh, he's very close to the mark, as far as I'm concerned here, where he continues and says, the standard social science model of everything being culturally constructed in some ways has it backwards. So um, then he takes a position that comes close to evolutionary uh, uh, biology. Mm -hmm. uh, something must, in fact, construct culture, okay, and something other than culture does give language its shape, even before language shapes our sense of, our, of self. Part of me wants to say that that's something that's a couple of billion years in evolution. <laughs> Yet, that view has been so simplified and so abused in the past that the humanists are rightfully on their guard about it. Yet, <laughs> it's, it's, it's sort of like asserting something and then taking it back a little bit. So there's, there's a little bit of truth in this approach, there's a little bit of remaining He's comforting something. himself. Huh? He's comforting. It's not just covering himself, he's trying to, he's circling around uh, a, a, a way of thinking it. Here, I believe. So, yet yeah, that view has been so simplified in the views that you got humanists. Why are, why are we suspicious of, uh, of, say, explaining things in terms of evolution? Well, it's not so much that evolution is a problem, it's that the assumptions built into the language that we use whenever we're talking about human beings as a species of animal that evolved present the, the, what post-structuralists and post modernists and people doing deconstruction up here would call metaphysical assumptions that we want to that we want to challenge. We don't want to say they're wrong, we want to say that they're that they're correct and we want to say that they're often accurate, but we want to say that they're not fully adequate, that these evolutionary ways of explaining our human, what makes us human, what makes consciousness, whatever it is that consciousness is, that <clears throat> while, while these vocabularies of explanation will provide us with um, some, something like accuracy, they're not going to be fully adequate to the complexity of what it is that we are as human beings. So if you keep, I'll keep using these words. So correctness has an, an, an accuracy and exactitude and precision. These all got their place. And we wouldn't be, make any advances without advances in exactitude. <clears throat> but um, it, when, we, when we are exact, we are often inadequate. Uh, it, it's sort of the argument that we were talking about uh, when we were discussing the essay of the blog by Richard Cox, where um, you know he, he's posing that question of, uh, well, we could maybe invent a machine that could be that could think like a human being or be a human being, but we'd have to have before we could do that some understanding of the complexity of a human being, right? So it's that kind of discussion, uh, but not in the way in which Richard's argument takes it. Yet there's no denying that we all have bodies. So Damien's very well aware of this. <laughs> and we can dump them up too. Yet there's no denying that we all have bodies and that there are more similarities between our anatomies and their attendant bodily states than there are differences. I see this fact as being, pardon me, as the next big challenge for humanistic disciplines. That's an intriguing move for me. Right? I'm not sure what he's, uh, is he talking about affect theory here? Maybe, I'm not sure. We must come to terms with a fuller and richer understanding of life science and all that it implies. I, re I do like this passage, so if you don't mind, I'll stay with it for a second. Why wouldn't a literary scholar want to know everything that neurologists are discovering about the way the brain works? And yet some critics carry on building theories that would render those discoveries impertinent at best, and even duplicitous or mal malevolent. 
how I would handle them. So. Um, anyway, that's back to <coughs> Will's comment. Do you, do you, are you recognizing in what you were saying uh, what the kind of comments that Powers is making and what they is saying? Or are you saying, are you thinking as you're listening to us that we're misunderstanding something? scholar want to know what new neurologists have discovered about the brain. Why would you not want to know that? And he repeats this that you can't be a literary scholar and, like, and he, he talks about paleontology or he talks about all these different disciplines, you know. Why do you not want to know about science? Because it's part of the world and you're writing about the world. And just this kind of very much about this interdisciplinary approach. He's taking a jab at here, uh, somebody might not pick up on this. With this phrase right here, and yet some critics carry on building theories that would render the uh, what we learn from any of the natural sciences uh, as impertinent or irrelevant. What he's he's arguing for there is there was a discussion back in the oh late 80s, early to mid 90s among literary critics that would basically say uh, science is uh, scientific insights are completely qualified by their place in history and in culture. And, uh, and so therefore, science is just reproducing the dominant bi the bias of the dominant culture. That, I'm oversimplifying the argument. But what he's basically saying there is there are a group of people who would just want to rule out of, you know, kind of make a whole body of emerging knowledge irrelevant because it's built on sort of uh, political and uh, social and gender biases that uh, that these critics have already uh, dismissed. So can that's I, what he's referring to in part. Can I ask a question? I want you all to go on this. Who thinks science is unbiased in its purest form? Over shot? Sure. Yeah, in a pure form. You do it, an experiment. Who think, uh, don't, don't just not vote. Who thinks science is biased? <laughs> you can't vote twice, Tom. Uh, <laughs> there's some of you who didn't vote. Why didn't you vote? I was I didn't know who we were going to vote. I was going to vote for the first time. All right, let's try again. Who thinks sci science is unbiased? That science is yes. Yeah. Who? What do you, if you had to vote, should we vote and then? Um, and then a few uh, years ago. I have to go with the unbiased. I, I had oh, this you, belief you in the purity of science and empiricism. And, uh, I've seen a few lectures given by people who have showed me that scientific results are incredibly prejudiced by the culture in which they're presented. Mm -hmm. um, and we all have it because we have this bias built into us based on where we come from. Um, Gadamer called it the prejudice against prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, a mathematical rule is a mathematical rule, it's always true. But the way that that science is presented in our culture, science is not an unbiased activity because of the way it is represented in culture. <coughs> that's, I guess that's why I had a hard time, because you use the word pure, because mm -hmm. yeah, okay, my you, language was better. <laughs> not exactly, yeah. yeah. Anything, anything humans experience, I mean, it's, if you're talking about humans conducting science, it's using information goes in and comes back out, of course it's biased. It's biased by whatever, to a certain degree, all the perspective that human has. Those of you who've done my classes know that this, we, I always talk about the impact of, we talked about how an interface or something will change your perception. But by changing the colors, changing the font size, you can change our sort of system. And remember the example with language. Uh, Elizabeth Loftus, you know the famous, she's a psychologist, for those of you who don't know, did the experiment where two cars crashed together. Mm -hmm. She shows a group of people the video and asks them at what speed did the cars collide. People will say 30 miles an hour. 
But if you ask them at what speed did the cars smash together, they'll say 40 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah? Just by changing that one word. So changing a word changes people's interpretation. So exactly the way you report science using the word collide or smash will change how people interpret the science. So it's not an unbiased activity because of the, and, and it comes back to uh, many, much of it to language and to uh -huh. Uh -huh. <coughs> representation. Right. Uh, yeah, you've been very patient waiting for this. What about something long. like, I don't know, <coughs> just like, can you go with scientific method and inform a hypothesis like, I think this species of frog eats more on average than another one. And you go through the scientific method and you know, do the testing and uh, develop the theory, it's like, all right, I was right. This frog does eat more. Like, what, what, how, where could that be biased? And like, what would any bias in that mean? Um, I'll give you an example of. Oh, <coughs> I didn't go to that one. But they had a um, a women in science conference here at Sydney last week, and I went to that, and they were. A lot of the talks were on gender bias in science, but one of them was on um, was a biology one about how people who do biology research can be very biased by political and social pressures. And they were talking about um, uh, a certain animal that it was a type of fish that was apparently eating the other fish, you know. And of course, the newspapers, um, and it was just after 9 11. So the whole country was in this state of almost xenophobia, afraid of people outside coming in, foreign invaders, all this kind of mentality was in the collective consciousness of the country. And so the newspapers all reported this as this invasive fish, you know, almost a terrorist fish coming in, <laughs> species of fish. And there was this kind of bias in the scientific literature. And this fish was actually perfectly harmless. You know, when they measured, and, and there was very little evidence for this, but it got blown up because of the cultural kind of status or the mentality that was happening at that time. And you can watch this happening, you know, and when you do um, the kind of research where you try and remove yourself from that and do something, I, I would use the term purer, but yeah. actually look at the actual data and results, it, it wasn't that dangerous a fish. But this was, you know, this was going into government policy. Government was making policy about this fish, you know, to eradicate it. So if we work with your example, I might ask the question, um, why were you asking the question about whether a frog eats, one, one species eats more than another, or and if males of the species eat more than another? Or the frog's body are worried about the body image. <laughs> <laughs> I was but, about frogs. Right, but what your example nicely does is it isolates the the the, uh, the experiment from the history and and, the, and the, the the larger context of motivation within which that particular experiment takes place. What Damien's examples are doing is they're contextualizing the the place within which science happens, and it goes back to the the problem goes back to a simple distinction that I introduced a couple weeks ago. It has to do with the, with remembering this difference. But it's one thing to model or to represent something, but then when you describe your model in a different context to another group of people, to, 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 to let that discovery that you've engaged in with that model or that set of experiments, then that's not just doing the work of representing with accuracy what was accomplished in the lab, then that report is acting in a larger world of socio-economical, political, an ideological relationships. Is that is that making some sense? What about something like uh, as Jamie mentioned, like a like a mathematical rule? Because there's some people say like those kind of concepts would be true even if like humans didn't exist at all. Like those are just constants. How could something like a mathematical rule or a physical law be biased? There, the problem is with the use of the word true. Okay. okay because people who come from my sort of philosophical position would say a mathematical, a, a mathematical formula, what would be a good example of one that would be uh, al always true? true. Well, well, the conservation of the Okay, so these are, these are good examples, uh, I think. Uh, we, we might say that they're correct. We, I, I think I could agree with you by, if by true you mean correct, or if you mean uh, universally applicable. 
or some, but I don't think I'd agree with your use of the word true there. And the reason would be because I come out of a philosophical tradition that has a very different grasp about what has happened to bring about the notion of this word truth. Um, and, and so um, if, you, if you want to claim truth for mathematics, then where we're disagreeing isn't on the nature of mathematics, it would be on the nature of truth. And I would say that your motivation, if you want to insist on using the word true in that discussion, then basically you are trying to say that there is an authority that mathematics has that uh, we don't find in other kinds of discourses that might have an equal claim on what we would call true. Is that making some, some sense? I, I hope I'm speaking as clearly Isn't as I can. That Isn't what the case? That, that math can be claims that certain other disciplines can't by virtue of, um, if you're talking about it certainly can, it certainly can. But those claims are, are, have to be understood as belonging to the realm of, of correctness uh -huh. in, in this vocabulary that I'm using, rather than in the realm of the truth. Okay. So I'm saying basically mathematicians, empiricists, positivists, what uh, Powers was referring to a while back in that quotation is the standard social science model, right? The, the, the privileging of the natural sciences and their, and their assumptions is the problem. I so I don't want to say that there's not a role or a place for this kind of knowledge in the world. I agree with uh, Powers when he's talking about, you know, wouldn't anybody want to know everything that neurologists can know? I say, yes, let's go for it. I'm not sure that, as far as wording goes, I'm not sure scientists are up for, a lot of people will say truth, um, but the truth, like you, like you were explaining, is, is kind of loaded. Uh, it's really loaded. And it carries all this other stuff with it. Um, I think the simplest, correct way to express it is um, verified. Reproduce, reproduce. I'm comfortable with that, as long as you, uh, the, as long as you understand that, uh, uh, the, the, as long as the word verify doesn't slip into this notion of veritas, the the veritas is similar, the, yeah. the wrong word for truth. So, so it's it, what happens is uh, there's been a, something of a declension. The word truth uh, used to involve lots of different kinds of experiences, uh, and it's been narrowed down in in our positivist time to be something like correctness. So, what what, what comes with this is the. Uh, it's a way of silencing people. It's a way of ruling out certain kinds of testimony, right? If you can't prove it, right, then we can't allow it. Those sort, those sort of issues. Okay. I don't know if this is a simple example, but go back to the uh, motor vehicle collision example. Mm -hmm. The law of conservation of momentum is always true when two motor vehicles collide. You can calculate. Well, it's correct. You can calculate the transfer of energy between the vehicles and the movement of the vehicles. <coughs> But when we report that, that scientific uh, result, I can use the word collide or smash. And the truth then varies. The, the numbers haven't changed, but the truth and the way that, that result is interpreted in the world has changed. Yeah? Does that, does I like that, that yeah. And yeah. I'm very comfortable with that, uh, yeah. that, that explanation. I'm just a little cautious about how you're using the word true there. Yeah. <laughs> the, the view. But what you're talking about is the difference in connotations and words between and collide and smash. And the different, that, the, different, the different way that science is interpreted can be interpreted in many ways in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the, the mathematics changing. It's about culturally it all has different you know, It's about what you do with that information about that frog that's got an appetite. Can you repeat the thing you said right before uh, Anthony asked a question, because I can't remember what you said, but I feel like you said, and I was right close to Bernard. Oh, you, uh, what, what did I say? It's on, uh, we've oh, got it on, we've got it on YouTube, yeah, it's so. On you. so it, was, uh, it was about truth, you know, the nature of uh, uh, It's not accurate to say it this way, historically, but uh, there was a, this German philosopher that I talk about a lot, Heidegger, he took a look at the Greek word, the ancient Greek word for truth, and he noticed that it, it, if we translate it into English, it would be more accurately translated as an unconcealing or as an unforgetting, rather than as something that we assert as uh, correct. 
So the, what we're dealing with is that, uh, let me see if I can show you this on a, I do have a PowerPoint slide that might help to visualize this. Um, this may just may just help you to see. So what Heidegger is going to say is that there's been, if you just think about Western society for, for in, in a grand sweeping sort of way, we have the ancient world, and then we get into the Christian Middle Ages, and then when the Christian Middle Ages sort of start to fall apart in the Renaissance, we, we get the emergence of modern sciences research. So what Heidegger wants to say in the Age of the World Picture essay, which I think is on uh, canvas for you, I'm just lifting it right from there. He wants to say that there are these different senses of knowing for the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks' sense of knowing couldn't pursue exactness. They, they, didn't re they weren't really preoccupied with exactness, and he goes into some detail there. But see, what's happened when, when modern science emerges as research, it becomes mathematical. So once modern science becomes mathematical, it can pursue exactness. It can pursue uh, correctness with greater levels of precision, so that now we can measure things at incredible levels of precision that were just impossible to imagine in the Middle Ages. Is that making some sense? So what, what Heidegger wants to say is as we move from each one of these periods to the other, what's happening is our sense of truth itself is changing and altering. And but, but that doesn't prevent him from saying there's something about the concept and the understanding of truth in the ancient world that still persists into our own time, just that we're not accessing it anymore because we, we're thinking about truth in terms of, of, of correctness. Uh, that's a quick, is that helping to uh, manage the... Tom, the Tom's been okay. wanting to join in here for that. Um, the, the whole, I think the whole discussion of uh, whether science is biased kind of brings in uh, the same argument that you have to have when you say the science versus religion argument, which is that both rely heavily on faith. Uh, with the idea, in different ways, yes, but uh, in science you rely heavily on observation and the idea that your observations are correct. I mean, that, yes, unlike, unlike, faith, unlike um, religion, science is more built on uh, with faith as like a starting point, but the fact of the matter is, like your your observations, you have faith that you are, you have to have faith that your observations and your ability to observe are are correct. And in order to do that, you are pro you kind of inadvertently approach things from a certain point of view because you observe things from a certain point of view. Okay. Hence, okay. like hence, like uh, I think uh, they use the. Uh, example of, uh, I've heard the example of Euclid. Euclidean geometry is great um, as far as a, uh, like it's, it's a very good model of, of mathematical accuracy, uh, except for like the fifth possible, like the, the general idea of like um, two lines, uh, I forget my Parallel line. Parallel lines. Yeah, yeah like, um, but there's one, there's, there's, uh, couple of things that like they specifically only work on a flat plane. So when things like when when we got into astrophysics, that's where like that's that's where Euclidean geometry sort of went out the window. Because right. If you assume that the universe is curved, right, and not flat, then parallel lines it's the it's the classic example of that. Um, I'll come back to what you're saying about faith in a second, but well, I think it kind of goes with oh, okay. the exactness has yeah. changed over time too, right? Exactly. The exactness now is it has to be ninety-five percent exact to be considered science. Well, but, uh, uh, it varies on the branch of science. Right, right. I mean, well, the critic is constant. That's a lot more than exact. Whatever the key value is, hmm? whatever the key value is, yeah. Yeah. you sign ninety-nine percent, ninety-nine point nine nine nine. Human experimentation ninety-five for significance, but right. the explosion is a lot more accurate. Yeah. What, what Heidegger is going to do uh, in this essay, Age of the World Picture, so this is sort of right at the start of that essay on the Age of the World Picture. Uh, just a little bit of a, my own bias here. Um, Heidegger has this very developed, and this is a very sophisticated uh, philosophy of science that almost everybody who does the philosophy of science has ignored. Okay. Um, so 
uh, it's just kind of a heads up. If you're really trying to work in these materials and if it becomes something of a, of a need for you in your own career as you go on into grad school or into a professional career in some way, working with the uh, philosophy of science issues, <coughs> this is really an underappreciated uh, philosophy of science. Now, uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details. It's really very densely written in the Age of the World Picture essay. But essentially what Heidegger's going to do is he's going to make the point that Damien was just making a second ago, and, and that you're making about exactness. Certain sciences will only be exact because of the material that they study. So a, a theoretical physicist is going to be exact in different ways than a biologist. And that exactness is going to vary depending upon what instruments are available to them and, and the accuracy of those instruments. So what Heidegger's going to do is he's going to say that each discipline in the natural sciences marks out ahead of time its particular territory. So a biologist thinks about everything that is from the perspective of bios or life. Biologists say we're going to study life, right? Uh, physicists say we're going to study phys uh, Phusis was an old Greek word for the cosmos, for the way in which the cosmos kind of was constantly involved in, in shifting and changing, and, but nevertheless there was some kind of constancy about it. So physics is studying something other than bios, right? And, and so there are going to be different expectations on, on uh, the biologists because they're proceeding with a bias, to use the earlier language of the conversation. They're setting out to understand not everything, but living things, right? Whatever they're going to factor in is counting as, as something that's alive. Okay, what is perceived, these two words in English seem very similar to us. And it's a translation problem. What, he, what Heidegger is trying to get at in this notion of procedure, he uses the German word Vorgehen. Do you want to help me with that one? Vorgehen. Vorgehen. Yeah. It's, like, it's like a going before. Yeah. right? And so what he wants to say is that you posit in advance through your hypothesis. It's kind of projection. So you, you posit something in advance, and then you set about trying to figure out, well, what's the case for it? What's the case against it? So the, the fun, the the foundational principles of any, of any science are those early statements that a science makes that, about its own project. And those are usually the founding hypotheses of that particular field. And then what he talks about with methodology is how you move from experiment and the assessing of experiments, the reflection upon the experiments, and how you arrive at things like rules and laws and theories. So that's the activity that he wants to talk about in terms of methodology. And then he wants to say, once these things are working, once these things are in place, then it's just a matter of continuing to pursue the, the question and uh, to working out the details in the, in the lab. Okay? So this is what constitutes modern science's research. But there are many different kinds of knowing. And this is, for, from Heidegger's point of view, this is the achievement of calculative thinking. If you remember the stuff in the memorial address. So what you have in this moment in the, in the Heidegger essay uh, in the age of the world picture is a much more defined, much more carefully elaborated description of what he's going to call calculative thinking in that memorial address essay. Richard. Um, I, a, I feel that, um, uh, that, um, that uh, non-mathematical uh, uh, ideas are not getting enough, uh, uh, enough uh, uh, they're, they're, they, uh, they're, they're not getting enough uh, uh, attention. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that this is especially important 